The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so uh, let's uh, situate ourselves where we are. Um, so we're starting to really make a lot of progress here, moving in the V model. Today's topic is uh, session five, trade space exploration, concept selection, and PDR, preliminary design review. So there's a lot to talk about, and I'm going to go relatively quickly through this. So first I want to talk about decision analysis. Fundamentally, uh, when you come up for a PDR, you have to make a big decision, which is what concept are you going for? What is your system architecture? That's a big decision. You don't have all the details yet. The design is not fully done, but you've chosen your key architecture. That's a big decision, and there's a whole branch of research and science called decision analysis. So I want to tell you about that, uh, talk about some of the issues in concept selection, and then give you some tools for doing that in a kind of organized way. There's a couple of what I would say simple methods, uh, pew matrix and multi-attribute utility that are relatively, I think, straightforward. And then there's a bit more uh, kind of advanced uh, concept called non-dominance. Uh, Pareto frontiers getting into multi-objective optimization. And so at a minimum, when you choose your concept, you want to choose a non-dominated concept. And I'll explain what that means. And then we'll close with discussing what is a PDR, what do you do with the PDR, uh, what's the purpose of it. So here's, here's a, uh, another way to explain essentially the flow of things uh, as, as we um, come up to PDR. So the way you can think of it is you start with a need, right, and your requirements. Uh, that's, we've talked about that before. And then you have this creative phase, which we talked about last time, right? You come up with a lot of ideas, a lot of concepts, and, uh, and the, the funnel that you see here is, is going up. So the, each of these shapes here, the, the, the circle, the triangle, they're meant to represent fundamentally different concepts, different architecture, different way of satisfying the requirements. And so there's a, a lot of different things you could do and the funnel opens up. This is the sort of the size of, of, of options or alternatives you're considering. And then you, you, have to, you have to filter this down. In the end, you can only build one system, right? You have to choose one architecture. And this filtering down happens typically in two steps. One is uh, what we call concept screening, which is more qualitative, okay? And then uh, the actual concept selection is more quantitative, based on models, based on data, based on, on, on metrics. And then you arrive at PDR. So in this, in this sort of simplified view, we've chosen the square, right, as our concept. And we've made that decision by looking at, at the different metrics. So you can see that on this, on this graphic up here, we have metric one, metric two. You can see the triangle is dominated, right? The triangle doesn't do as well if we want to maximize metric one and two. So it wouldn't make sense to choose the triangle. But the circle and the, uh, the, the square, uh, circle does better on metric two, but less well on metric one. The, the square does better on metric one, not quite as well. And they cross over at some point. So whatever how you weigh this in decision making, the decision is made we're going to go for the square. That's our concept. And then you move to the actual system design post PDR, which is uh, all the details. So we're expanding the box now, the square, and designing all the details within the structure, the avionics, the software, the controls, and uh, Nets design modeling and optimization. And so here I'm showing you metric three, which is maybe another metric, and then design variable X1 which is some pretty detailed uh, decision that you make within that concept. And you're looking for the optimal, in this case, minimizing metric three. It's this point here. And then that gives you your, and I put this deliberately in quotes, optimal design. That's what you show at the CDR and the critical design review. And that's what you go and build. So that's roughly the, the flow of, of decision making. Any, any question about that, that general flow? 
So what we'll talk about today is essentially this portion here, concept screening and concept selection. So um, since you make a decision, uh, what is decision analysis? So decision analysis in general is methods and tools for ranking and choosing among competing alternatives or courses of action. And I just want to make uh, the word alternative. A lot of people use the word option and alternative sort of as synonyms. They're not, okay? They're not. Options and alternatives are not the same thing. An alternative means if I choose A, I can't choose B and C. But the fact that you've chosen A or the square or whatever your concept is means that uh, you cannot choose the other ones. An option means, well, given that I've chosen A, I could also add something on top of A, right? It's kind of like if you're buying a new car, are you going to get the winter package or not? That's an option, but you've chosen you know, a particular vehicle. So, so that, that's important. So alternatives are mutually exclusive choices or courses of action. So you need the alternatives. Those are the components, four components of a decision. You need criteria, which means how are you going to evaluate uh, and compare the alternatives. Then you need value judgments. You now apply the criteria to the alternatives to compare them. And then finally, you need a decision maker, which is either an individual or a group with preferences to then make the choice. Okay? Those are the four ingredients of decision analysis. And if we show this somewhat graphically, so here's our alternatives. We can do A, B, or C. Uh, the criteria in this case are cost, performance, and risk. Then we, we basically evaluate, uh, in this case, option or alternative A, I should say, for cost, for performance, for risk. And, and this gives us some score or number. And then we need to figure out a way to combine this to uh, rank the alternatives. And when it comes to ranking, there's a distinction between what's known as an ordinal scale and a cardinal scale. So in an ordinal ranking, all you really care about and do is say, what's the best choice, the second best choice, and the third choice? You've ordered the alternative. But you don't know in an ordinal ranking or ordinal scale whether you know, one and two were really close, and then there's a gip, big gap between two and three, or uh, you don't know that, and you don't really care. All you want is the rank order. Uh, when, you, when you put things on a cardinal scale, so this is a continuous line, you actually uh, get, in a sense, both the order, but you also see how close the alternatives are. So that's a cardinal scale as opposed to an ordinal scale. Okay? So, yes, please. Um, how do you get like a discrete value for something like risk or something like that? Or, and especially with an ordinal scale, if you have two things that are really close to each other, but the risk is kind of a blurried region, how do you? So then they would be equivalent in terms of that criterion. And uh, you can actually have ties, right? You can have alternatives that are tied. And, and I'll talk about, this is one of the issues in concept selection, is how do you do tie-breaking? Good question. Any, any questions at EPFL? I know this is very abstract, but fundamentally, that's what we do. Any, any questions <coughs> over there? Is it clear? Yes. OK, good. So let's, let's keep moving. Uh, so what are the issues? I think that's, so multiple criteria, how do you deal with them? We usually have multiple criteria. And how do we, and, and eventually, when you make a decision, when you pick a concept, you're somehow combining these criteria into a single measure, whether you're doing that explicitly or not. So how do you deal with these multiple criteria? We'll talk about that. Here's your, the point you know, that you brought up, what, what if there's ties? How do you break them? Uh, group decision making versus individual decision making. Who gets to really make the decision, right? And, uh, and this relates to the stakeholder analysis. Who has the power to make the decision in the end? And then uncertainty. Uh, did we choose the right criteria? Did we evaluate uh, each option properly? And then the big one is, are the, alter are the best alternatives represented? So you can choose among A, B, and C, but maybe there's this much, much better architecture or concept D out there 
but it's not in the decision set because it didn't, nobody thought of it or you know, some other thing happened and it didn't come up in concept generation. Right? So there's, there's a lot of uncertainties when you're doing this, so you have to be aware of it. So let me uh, talk about uh, two, again, quote and quote, simple methods for doing concept selection. The first one is called Pew Matrix, and then I'll talk about utility analysis. So the Pew Matrix essentially is a very uh, discrete method. It uses essentially plus, zero, and minus to score alternatives relative to a datum. A datum is a reference decision, a reference uh, architecture. And this is named after Stuart Pugh, who is a British, um, who is a British um, professor of design, essentially. And it's, it's a very simple method. Uh, and it's used extensively. Uh, it does have some pitfalls as well, but it's, it's very well known. So uh, Pew Matrix. And then the second one is called Utility Analysis. So it essentially maps all the criteria to a dimensionless utility. Uh, this is between 0 and 1. So 0 is a completely useless system. It has zero utility. And one is a system that has perfect utility. It, it can't really be improved. You could try to improve it, but your satisfaction would not increase. Okay? Uh, and this, is, this has very deep mathematical uh, theory, it's particularly uh, the von Neumann and Morgenstern um, utility that, um, that, uh, that was, was basically uh, developed in the, in the mid-20th century. Anybody seen the movie A Beautiful Mind? Yeah. What uh, what is the, what is A Beautiful Mind about? You want to push that? Uh, it's about John, uh, mathematician John Nash, who is an econ uh, a mathematician who won um, uh, I forget exactly what prize he had won. Um, I thought, but the uh, yeah. Um, he won the Nobel Prize. Was it the Nobel Prize? Yeah. Okay. Um, on and the game theory. For what? For game theory, yeah. right? And so, so the, 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 one of Nash's contributions was the idea of a Nash equilibrium. So we have multiple decision makers in, in gaming, and the question is, uh, you know, you have your current strategy, but is there a better move you could make? And if, if, if you could ma make a better move that improves your, your uh, satisfaction or your utility, uh, but but by doing this, uh, you decrease somebody else's utility, you may, not, you may not go there. So if you reach a Nash equilibrium, it means that everybody believes that this is the best they can achieve. And, and how do you measure that? Well, Nash actually uh, developed his Nash equilibrium and, and game theory building upon theories from, of Mon, von, uh, von Neumann and Morgenstern. So there's, there's very deep theory behind it. I'm not going to go very deep into it, but so you know that, that there's a lot behind utility analysis. OK, so let me uh, just talk you through the, the basic steps for doing a Pew matrix analysis. And I'll, I'll show you a very simple example. First step, you choose or develop the criteria for comparison. Um, so you know, how, how, what's important? How are we going to decide this uh, selection? And obviously, this should be based on a set of system requirements and goals. Now, we, there's two flavors of requirements. Remember what? Uh, let's ask here at EPFL. Uh, you remember the two flavors of requirements? What were the two flavors of requirements? Two types of requirements. I mean, there's actually six types, right? There's functional requirements, there's constraints, there's, there's uh, interface requirements, and so forth. What, what I'm trying to get at is there, there are requirements that use shall statements, and then there's requirements that use should statements, right? So the shall statements are what? What do the shall statements imply? So basically, for the shall, it's um, it's compulsory, and for uh, should, it's a goal of the system. That's right, exactly. So, 
In some sense, the shall state, the criteria associated with shall statements don't necessarily make the best criteria for the pew matrix. Because by definition, the concepts that you're evaluating should all satisfy the shall statements. Because if they don't, they're essentially infeasible, right? And, and you, shouldn't you shouldn't select among them in the first place. So, so architectures or concepts or alternatives that violate shall, you know, shall requirements do not satisfy you know, the, the must-have requirements. And you shouldn't, so you shouldn't use criteria that are associated with hard constraints. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, the requirements that are associated with should statements, those are good criteria for this pew matrix because the degree to which you satisfy this, the goals are somewhat variable. Therefore, you can then compare amongst alternatives. Okay? So that's number one. Number two, uh, thank you, that was, that was good. Uh, select the alternatives to be compared. So th those are coming out of concept generation. And one little bit tricky aspect here is when you're, uh, when you're putting together the alternatives, the concepts to be selected from, they should be represented at a similar level of detail of abstraction. It's, it is, it's not good to have one concept that's really detailed and you know a lot about it, and often it's kind of an existing system or something you've done before, and then there's this other concept that is very fuzzy. Uh, why, why shouldn't you compare something very detailed with something very, very poorly defined? Why do you think that's not a good practice? What do you guys think here? Yes, go ahead. Is it like it's not fair? Because yeah, they're, they're it's a, that's right. It's a fairness issue, and because the, the concepts that are poorly defined, often um, you're, you're too optimistic about them. That's sort of the typical, this looks really good, uh, look very promising, but, but it looks very promising because it's kind of ill-defined. So, um, so that's important. Try to represent all the concepts at about the same level of detail when you make the comparison. That's number two. Number three, you actually go through and generate the scores. And the key thing here, this is maybe the most important thing about the Pew Matrix, is you always use a datum. The datum is a reference. One of the alternatives that you're going to compare is your reference. So what you do is you always compare every other alternative in the set against the datum. And you say, for each criterion, is it better? Is it about the same? Or is it worse than the reference, the datum? So you don't compare all the alternatives pairwise against each other. You always compare against the datum. Then you compute the total scores, and I'll show you this in the example, and then there's variations. Like rather than better, equal, or worse, you could go to uh, a five point, you know, much better, a little better, or about the same. So there's some variations on the scoring, but the classic method just uses better, the same, or worse. So here's Excuse a, me, just a question. Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> just about the number three about generate scores and use a datum. By doing so, don't you exclude solution that could have on the general picture be better than others? What do you mean by general picture? I should take all the solution that you have and at the end one performs slightly better than the other but you couldn't spot it uh, by using the datum? Yeah. So uh, it's, a, it's a very good question, and so this is a question of resolution, right? How good is your resolution? The, the main purpose of the Pew Matrix is not for making the final choice right away. The main purpose of the Pew Matrix is actually to eliminate concepts that are, that are kind of, you can tell already that they're, they're not competitive. And you don't typically do Q matrix one time and then say that's the best one. You use it essentially to eliminate, you know, clearly <coughs> inferior solutions. Does that make sense? I'm really sorry, but the, like the, the video got cut just in, uh, during your explanation. Okay. So what I, let me repeat this. Um, so the, the purpose of the Pew matrix is not to select the final concept as a result of doing the Pew matrix, 
but to identify inferior concepts, to eliminate them from the set. Okay? Uh, okay. All right. So here's a, here's a kind of uh, generic example uh, to explain how this works. So here's our uh, Pew matrix, our evaluation matrix. On the rows, we have our criteria. That could be cost, performance, resilience, uh, effectiveness. Um, and, and so those are called A, B, C, D, E, and F. So we have six criteria. And then the, the column, each column represents a concept, a design, an architecture. And so, you know, this, we're designing, I guess we're designing beams here or levers or something like that. So this is a solid cylinder. This is a cylinder that's hollow. This is a square cross-section. This is a triangular cross-section. You get the picture, right? They're, they're qualitatively different. Uh, and then you know, wh which, one is our, which one is our reference here? Which, co which concept? Number seven, right? If you look at seven, this, this sort of uh, shallow triangle, seven, it says datum. You see that? Which means that this is our baseline, our reference, our datum. And then what you do is, as you fill this in, you, so for you, and, and you can do it two ways. You can do, uh, pick, say, concept one, the, the solid cylinder, and then compare it against seven for all criteria. So A, so concept one is better than concept seven in criterion A, so it gets a plus. It's also better in B, it gets a plus. It's worse in C and D, so this is a minus compared to seven and so forth. So, so the two ways of filling it in is you do concept by concept, column wise, or you can do it row wise. Right? And there's, there's some arguments in favor of one or the other. But essentially, you, you fill in this matrix by, uh, by always comparing against number seven. Alexis, what's your question? Yeah, uh, just a question. Should, should not we weight the criteria? I mean that if, uh, for example, if the criteria A is more important, shall we put more weight on it? No. No. At this point, at this point in the Pew matrix, the criteria are unweighted. This is very important. You don't say B is twice as important as C. <coughs> They're unweighted when you, when you first do this. Eventually, when you do the final selection, you will probably weigh them. But when you first do this, there's no weighting. They're equal. Okay? Yes, go ahead. Uh, are there any rules in picking your datum, or do you just ah. arbitrarily? So I'll get into that. Um, you, it, it should be, a, a, it should be a, a design that you think is competitive, that uh, maybe you know, it, you know it. Maybe it's an existing sort of system with data on it, uh, kind of a, no, a known quantity. But if you, don't have, if you don't have any information, if they're all equal, then it's a random choice. Okay? So uh, then once you've filled in this matrix, so S here is for same, right? Same, about the same. Then you essentially sum all the pluses, you sum all the minuses, and then you have the net, sort of the net result, unweighted, right? So here you can essentially compare that, you can see that you know, concept one is better in three and worse in three than the datum. Um, you can see that, uh, you can see that um, concept two is inferior in three criteria, better in two and the same in one. But we're not actually summing. We're not actually summing at this point because we, we're not weighting these, okay? But it, it gives you a, a basis of understanding. Okay, so let's do a quick uh, partner exercise. Um, what do you see as the main advantages and potential disadvantages or pitfalls of this method? So turn to your partner, discuss this for a few minutes, and then we'll, we'll see what you came up with. So it's a really un an unweighted method, and it's a good primary selection. It eliminates, uh, if you know what to eliminate, to simplify your convergence. And it's not the, it does not select your criteria or select your concept know what is going to be falling out anyway to simplify the method. Okay? Mm -hmm. so. 
All right. Uh, good. So uh, let's uh, let's see advantages. Let's get a couple here, and then we'll sort of go back and forth uh, between here and EPFL. Yeah. So what are what's good about this method? Hmm? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, so I think Nate and I were talking that uh, it is a relatively simple decision making process. So instead of just going with some sort of gut feeling or not looking at everything, uh, you can get stuff down on paper and actually see mm -hmm. these criteria and how they relate to each other. Yeah, so simplicity. What else? Go ahead, Sam. Uh, it allows you to look at a large array of concepts very quickly. Okay, large uh, samples. That's not a great... Uh, oh, sorry, thanks. Uh, quick, right? You said quick. Okay. Uh, what advantages, EPFL, what did you guys come up with? So simple, it allows you to look at a lot of concepts, it's quick. What else? So here at EPFL, we, we got um, basically the same things. The, this method is simple and it's pretty fast and uh, pretty straightforward too. So this is, I think, a good way to get rid of some of the, the concepts uh, pretty fast. Okay. Any, anything else that we didn't catch? There's one more. There's one I'd like to put on this list. Veronica, go ahead. Qualitative. Just put in the microphone. I think, yeah. Go ahead. Can you just quickly repeat that? Just that it's qualitative. And that you see that as an advantage, actually. I think you can see it both ways. Yeah. So uh, I, I think what you implied with this is it stimulates discussion, right? It stimulates debate. There's, there's maybe so another uh, criterion on the positive side. Go ahead. And it would be that it's extremely easy to explain to NASA, to ESA, or to whoever your customer is, because, uh, and they can relate to it, as the criteria are mostly physical or scientific, I mean, larger, stronger, lighter, cheaper, um, it's probably very intuitive, yes, as you say. Okay, great. Now, downsides. What are the downsides of the method? Go ahead. Make sure you... I think it, um... Definitely depends on which you pick as a datum. Right? Like if you pick the, the, the clearly best one as a datum, then it's not going to give you much information. Or if you pick like the worst one as a datum, then all of them will be better, and you kind of don't really gain much information from that. So you might have to like iterate with different datums. Yes, there's actually research on this. There's some research. This matrix, this Pew matrix method, by the way, has been studied like scientifically quite a bit. There's quite a literature on it. And the point that you brought up was, was studied. Like, for example, they, they would basically give the same criteria and the same alternatives to different groups of people, but then give them a different datum. And that's a little tricky. Is, 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 is the result different because it's a different group dynamic? Or is it, but the, this has been done sort of statistically, and, and the, date, the choice of datum has an impact on the outcome. Very good. That's, that's a, actually a pretty subtle point. That, that was excellent. What are some other, yes, please go ahead. While it's very easy to implement and anyone can do it, it's very subjective. So if you have somebody that doesn't have a whole lot of uh, experience in a certain area, um, they may get a completely different answer than somebody who is an expert looking at the so same type of subjectivity, which basically repeatability, hmm. Uh, maybe low, right? You want to have so robustness of the method such that if you repeated this multiple times or you ha gave it to different groups of people, you want to have some confidence that the results would come out similarly. Very good. Uh, let's see, uh, EPFL, any, any downsides? So datum dependent, subjective, and what else? Um, so what we are thinking is that the, the criteria is mm, well, depend from group to group. Uh, the, it doesn't seem to be clearly defined what you need, although there are some that are straightforward. And um, our other point... Data independence. 
Yeah, uh, datum dependence. Uh, if you choose a very easy solution, uh, or let's say a very bad solution as a um, as a reference, then all the others look good. And finally, if you have a co um, if you judge on the overall concept, and maybe you discard one or two solutions, but inside those concepts, you have ideas that that you could uh, keep or use, then uh, then they might be uh, lost. Okay, so loss of sub-concepts, okay. Okay, good. Uh, anything else here, Mike? Um, we were talking about how it's very easy to <coughs> tune your metrics to be, um, like, to be biased. I see, so, so gaming, yeah. right, gaming, gaming the, basically producing a matrix to give you the answer you want that you already had preordained, sort of, right? That, that's essentially what you're saying, yeah. Okay, uh, very good, so um, I, these are all, mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, uh, just sort of a, a one last disadvantage of the method that I think is uh, a bit interesting because uh, I think the, the way of grading everything with plus or minus could be a bit coarse because you can imagine a system, for instance, that is very, very good in one criteria and then pretty bad in all the others, and it could be a good concept, but it's disregarded nonetheless. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Bastian. Pascal? Sorry? Uh, Pascal. Is your name Pascal? Bastian. Martin. Bastian. <laughs> okay. Uh, keep that point until we, we're going to talk about exactly that point when it comes to non dominance, okay? So, uh, please reserve, this is great, uh, just we'll come back to that in a few minutes, okay? All right, so this is great, uh, I, think you, I think you really got it, this is, exact, this is a very good, good list. So, so you may say, well, uh, okay, this is good for like beams and you know, very simple things, so I want to show you an example of an application of the Pew Matrix to uh, what I would argue is a fairly complex, complex uh, architectural decision. And uh, what I'll talk to you about is a thesis that was done here at MIT in uh, 2003, so a while ago, 12 years ago, by uh, Brian Smith. He was uh, an SDM student and uh, was one of the easiest students ever to advise, uh, very knowledgeable in nuclear uh, propulsion and nuclear power. He's now the branch chief for nuclear power propulsion at NASA Glenn Research Center in Ohio. And so, at the time, NASA had a mission that was kind of high priority called GMO, Jupiter Icy Moons Mission. And when you go out to Jupiter, and you want to not just do a flyby, but you actually want to, you know, go to different orbits, you want to do uh, high power imaging, you need a lot of power. You're far from the sun. RTGs only give you 100 watts or so per RTG, so nuclear power is pretty much the way to go. But there's a lot of different choices of different nuclear reactor architectures that would potentially, uh, and then couple that with the propulsion system. So that was the, the challenge was, you know, uh, sifting through the large po space of possibility for nuclear electric power, nuclear exploration class electric power and propulsion systems. And, you know, he here's the, the, the way the study was set up is, you know, the expansion phase, the filtering, and then the screening phase. So here's the architectural space, the way it was defined. So nuclear, electric, power, and propulsion is what we're after. And there's different um, ways to generate these alternatives. So the most important is the design vector, the type of reactor, the operating temperature, the power conversion scheme, the heat exchange, and then the fuel type. And then there were uh, requirements. So this is the power range, the delivery timeline, uh, the fact that you should be able to do it in a single launch and then the operational lifetime of the system. So those were the shell requirements. Every architecture had to meet these requirements, otherwise it would not be considered. And then there were some things that were assumed as constants. They're shown here. There was a policy vector in terms of funding profiles, international partnerships, at what altitude you could insert the system uh, into orbit, and then influence on future missions. And the objective vector is the criteria for the decision. Technolo TRL is technology readiness level, how much infrastructure do you need, complexity, strategic value 
to the nation. This is a little fuzzy, but basically what this means is could you use it for other applications than exploring Jupiter? Uh, the schedule, the launch packaging, power specific mass, which is uh, watts per kilogram, the uh, lifetime. So it's interesting, you have lifetime here and here. So there's a minimum lifetime, right? And if you satisfy this, the, the extra life you get can actually be used as a, as a decision criteria. How does it interact with the payload? Like, do you need a lot of shielding? And then adaptability. Can you adapt it for different missions? Yep. On the previous slide, we had both possible and feasible on there as mm -hmm. different kind of criteria. Um, what do you have for kind of a difference for those? So uh, essentially, possible is, you know, this is sort of the combinatorial space. And then applying the, the hard constraints based on the requirements vector gets you from possible to feasible. They satisfy your, your must-have requirements, your shell requirements. And then you use, in screening, you use the objective vector, these criteria, you use to uh, go from here to here, right? So let me show you this, uh, what this looks like. And I'll post this thesis if you're interested. It's really, the whole thesis is about doing this process. Um, so here we have, each column represents a different reactor architecture. So, and you can see in the legend what, what these things mean. So for the reactor type, we have a um, liquid metal, gas cooled, or um, heat pipe uh, type reactor. These are three types of nuclear uh, fission reactors. For fuel, we have two types of fuel, if I remember correctly. We have UO2 or UN. For uh, the temperature at which the reactor would be run, we have medium or high. For the conversions, this is the thermodynamics, the how do you get the heat out of the reactor, we have a Brayton or a Rankine cycle, uh, or a thermoelectric uh, reactor, which is basically directly converting the heat to electricity without a working fluid. And then um, D is the heat exchange, um, sort of heat, heat, heat exchange architecture, which is either direct or indirect. And so you can see that each of these uh, columns represents a different uh, kind of architecture, and they're colored here by, you know, the, so this is, the dark is a direct heat pipe with, um, uh, direct heat pipe with liquid metal reactor and so forth. So that's, that's essentially the, the uh, what you're seeing here is the filtered set that is, that is deemed to be feasible, potentially feasible. And then uh, the actual uh, screening is done based on, on this. So th this is the actual Pew matrix here. So we have the, um, the concept combinations, which are the columns. The datum here is the one that's shaded in gray. So it's a liquid metal reactor um, with a thermal, it's a liquid metal thermoelectric reactor with uh, indirect heat exchange, UN fuel type, and a high operating temperature. And it, the, why was this chosen? Well, if you look here, it says SP100 reference. So the US actually has launched, at least officially, as far as we know, one nuclear reactor into space, and that's the SP100. You can look it up. It, it's a, there's a history behind it. And uh, that's the architecture of the SP100. So it was launched. We had data on it. It's a known quantity. The Russians, it turns out, Russia has launched a lot of nuclear reactors uh, over the years. Uh, but this is, sort of the, this is sort of the US baseline, if you want to call it that. And then all of these other combinations are compared against the SP100, the, the reference reactor. And so you can see here that, um, that the comparison is drawn against, so zero means you know, it's, it's about, uh, so for TRL, it means it's about equally mature. A plus means it's actually more mature. A negative means it's less mature than the SP100. And at the end of this, you can actually, uh, you look at the total pluses and zeros and minuses. And then in this case, uh, what Brian did, he did calculate a net score. That's an unweighted score. Basically, uh, if you give 
one point, so let's look at the first one. So it has four pluses, right? It has four pluses, and it has five equal to the SP100 to the datum, and it has two minus. So it's worse than two, better in four criteria, and the same in five. So the net score would be plus two, because it's better in, in two criteria, net. But it's unweighted. And so in order to uh, figure out what, based on this net score, so a zero net score would say it's about equal to, to the datum, but it may be in other cr different criteria, uh, but, but n essentially it's about the same. If it's a plus two, uh, then it is uh, potentially better than the SP100. But you don't know that 100% because you haven't weighted the criteria. It's really used for screening. So the ones that are circled are, uh, the ones that are circled are, are better essentially than, than the datum. And the ones that are, uh, th this is, I'm sorry, the, the rank, this is the rank among the sets. So if you have a one here, you're in the, in the rank one, and there's two, cr two architectures. The first two are rank one, and then we have this architecture, which is rank two. The datum itself plus two other architectures are rank three. And then you see that there's some, like for example, this architecture here is rank eight, right? So it, it, why is that? Because it's not better in any criteria than the datum. It's the same in six, and it's worse in five, right? So that gives you an indication that this particular concept probably is, is not very attractive, and you, you, would, you would eliminate that, okay? So um, that's, essentially, um, that's essentially an application of the Pew matrix to a, a pretty real-world complex uh, problem. So what the Pew matrix is for is essentially structured, structuring and representing the evaluation procedure. It serves as a common visual. It provides some amount of discipline and helps break down uh, self-sealing behavior, meaning what that means is people defending their concepts, you know, without sort of seeing the bigger picture. It encourages teamwork. It helps you eliminate weaker ideas, retain a set of stronger concepts. And then this is interesting, divergence. It helps to identify opportunities for combination. There's also a way to use this uh, Pew Matrix method multiple times. And the way you would do this is you would say, okay, so these, these are the stronger concepts here, right? The ones that do equally well or maybe even a little better than the datum. What are the strengths and weaknesses of each concept? And can, can we hybridize them? Can we create some hybrid concepts? And, and so you you eliminate the weaker ones, the surviving concepts are kept and then maybe hybridized with each other, so you expand and create more concepts again, maybe a little bit more detailed, and then you apply the Pew matrix again. So it's kind of an iterative application of the Pew matrix where you eliminate, you keep strong concepts, you hybridize them, and then you repeat it two or three times. And there's actually research on this as well. Professor Dan Fry, who's here at MIT in uh, mechanical engineering, has done research on that and shown that uh, that can actually lead to very good outcomes. So this, this sort of gradual, so then the, you don't have just one expansion and, and contraction of your concept space, but it sort of goes multiple times, but, but eventually it does converge. So this is a, a more refined application of the method. What Pew Matrix is not good for is automatic decision making, right? Uh, completely controlling the process. So, you know, the idea of, of sort of automating the Pew Matrix is, is should not be automatic, and it's not really done. It's not really good for trade studies. Um, challenges. <laughs> so here's some quotes: People who have a lot of experience exhibit an impatience. Get on with it. Uh, this procedure holds us back, right? Strong-willed individuals who have a lot of experience and whose initial concepts have not emerged in the final selection commence a defensive uh, based on emotion, experience, and bluster, right? So there's this social dynamics that gets unfolded here. So therefore, it is recommended to do Pew Matrix with a facilitator, somebody who, kind of similar to brainstorming, right, where you have a facilitator. So you have a facilitator for Pew Matrix. So somebody who controls the flow and pace of the session, records the results, tries to maintain some discipline, 
com always compare against the datum. I I've seen Pew matrix sessions where you start with the datum, and then by the third or fourth concept, people are starting to do pairwise comparisons, and the datum is sort of lost. That should not happen, right? Uh, preventing tangents, um, but encourage clarification. What do we really mean by criteria? Uh, clarification of the concepts, and then opportunities for divergence and hybrids. So the critique of the method is, uh, I think a lot of these things you've already mentioned, the ranking depends on the choice of datum, the weighting, you know, the, there's no real weighting in the, in the classic method. Uh, however, you can implement a weighted version of the Pew method, but then you have to have the whole discussion about the weightings a priori. Um, next, I'm going to talk about multi-attribute utility. And so Pew matrix and multi-attribute utility could give you a different rank order of alternatives. So how, how do you reconcile that? Uh, the most important criteria may be intangible and missing from the list. And my personal opinion on this is that the Pew matrix is useful and simple to use. It stimulates discussion about the criteria, the alternatives, but it shouldn't be your only means of concept selection. But it's usually one of the first things you should do because you learn a lot from doing it. Okay? Any, any questions about Pew matrix before I move on? Yes, Sam. Should it always be done with a group that's, I mean, working together and and sort of discussing the concepts, or could you also have people sort of individually filling them out and then combining the results? So, yeah, you, should, you do it as a group, uh, because in the discussion with the group, uh, there's a lot of clarification that happens. Now, if you do it separately, and you firewall people from each other, and have people do this individually, and then try to combine the results, right, later, that's actually called, that's closer to a method called the Delphi method, and which I'm not going to talk about here. But the Delphi method means you're, you're asking these kind of questions to experts. You, they give you the answers, and then you anonymize the answers <coughs> and reflect the combined answers back to the group. And then you eliminate the social dynamics. And you can see whether, is my, was my assessment an outlier? You know, am I close to the center of the group? So the, the, the Delphi method has a lot of benefits, but it's not usually, you, you don't have the social dynamic in the same way, uh, which is sort of essential to make this work. Good question, though. Any, any questions at EPFL about Pew Matrix before I move on? No, it's clear. OK, go ahead. Is it useful to almost have like an independent group do this as opposed to, you know, everyone generates their ideas and then everyone's trying to, you know, kind of <laughs> fill out the matrix so that their idea wins? Usually not because uh, if you give it to an independent group, they, they know much less about the problem. You know, they probably weren't involved in generating the alternatives. They weren't involved in selecting the criteria. You know, they're, they're probably not as knowledgeable. And so there is, there is an advantage of doing it, you know, within the team. But then, you know, before you actually go and pull the trigger on a final, that's the PDR, you get that vetted by independent uh, people. That's sort of the, that's what happens at the PDR. Okay. Maybe one point here is that you can invite uh, the external people to join your discussion. So you have your design team, and it's very good to have the two or three experts to come and sit in the meeting and then give their opinion. And with the Pew matrix, as it's pretty straightforward and simple, you probably shouldn't then bias the result, but you could probably enrich it. That's, that's a great point. I, I agree with that, Volker. Absolutely. Yeah. OK, so let's uh, switch gears to uh, utility theory or multi-attribute utility theory. So what's that all about? So like I said, utility is a very uh, deeply rooted concept in economics. And so it's defined as utility is a measure of relative happiness or satisfaction or gratification gained by consuming different bundles of goods and services. This is sort of economic, very, you know, this is how economists talk. Uh, so it's, it's, the idea is you want to choose a concept or an alternative that, 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 that will maximize your happiness, your satisfaction, your, your gratification. And whenever you buy something, it, w when you go to uh, Anna's Taqueria or wherever you guys have lunch, or at EPFL you go to the Rolex Center and you pick from the menu, 
you're actually doing just that, right? You have, you know, how much money do I have in my pocket? How hungry am I? Uh, am I? Am I a vegetarian or not? That would filter out some menu items right away, right? And, and you, you pick every day, you pick your lunch. Well, you're doing exactly this. You don't really know that you're doing it, but in your mind, as you're picking from the menu and then making your choice, you're maximizing your utility at that moment. So we do this every day. Here in this class, we talk about you know, designing complex systems. So we, we need to sort of do it a little bit more deliberately. But, but this is not just some abstract thing. We do this every day. And, and so the idea is essentially we have this consumption set X, which are our alternatives, mutually exclusive alternatives, and then we map that to the real scale. Uh, we rank each member of the consumption set. So we map the alternatives on this utility scale, in this case the cardinal scale between 0 and 1. So um, the way this is done, in order to do the mapping, right, from the criteria to um, utility, you need these mapping functions. And we call these utility functions. They're called utility functions. So basically we have, uh, I'm going to use J here for, for, J means essentially your attribute, your objective, um, and then U is your utility. And so there are different shapes of utility functions, and different scholars call them differently. So this is Cook. He says this is smaller is better or larger is better. And you see they're essentially monotonically increasing or decreasing curves. Uh, Messac, another uh, scholar in multi-objective design, calls this class 1S, class 2S. So what would be an example of a uh, smaller is better utility function. What would be an example? What would be an example? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, an example would be like the weight of a launch vehicle that's decreasing. The, the, the launch mass? Yeah, launch Okay, vehicle. launch mass, okay. Uh, what about EPFL? Smaller is better. Cost. Cost. Cost, right. So, um, okay, larger is better. Revenue. Revenue. Revenue, yeah. Maybe uh, range, endurance, uh, reliability, right? Then there's, uh, the next one is strictly concave or strictly convex, which is nominal is better. So the idea there is there's a sweet spot, right? You want, you want the performance or the attribute to be at a pretty specific value. And if you deviate from that uh, on the up or down side, then, um, then the utility decreases. So what would be an example of that? Right. Size of a meal, for example. Size of a meal, OK. Well, uh, there's some restaurants may beg to differ, right? All you can eat. <laughs> yes, Norik, very good, yes. What do you think? Yep. Yeah. So if you, you there's a very specific interface condition. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead at EPFL. Nominal is better. Like for example, ambient uh, temperature. Yeah. So temperature, ambient temperature. Right. We're humans are pretty. Uh, we have a fairly narrow range where we say this is good. Now we can you know put on a sweater or you know but but, but it's a fairly narrow range. So. Uh, the great example. Then, then the next one is range is better, which is uh, concave or convex. So this is the idea that as long as you're within this interval, within the interval itself, you're sort of indifferent, right? But then when you when you drop outside the interval, then utility decreases or increases. And then the last one is kind of very exotic, non-monotonic utility functions that have multiple peaks. They exist in theory. But in practice, uh, you almost never see them. I can't give you a good example of a multimodal one. But in theory, uh, they do exist. Well, there, there is one. And it's clearly the landing sites on a planet. OK. Because you have, the, you have the one injection trajectory, and then you have the primary sites or the primary ellipse, then the secondary. And uh, 
it's uh, non-monotonic. Mostly the other way down doesn't go up, it goes down. So you have ideal, and then you're out of it. Then you would land on rocks, and then you have the next plateau, and maybe a third one, on one pass by. That's an interesting. Uh, that's an interesting comment. Um, I'm I'm trying to figure out what what's the attribute, what's the engineering attribute that goes with that. Uh, well, it's uh, the tolerance of on the injection. I know that uh, at JPL, by the way, thanks for organizing the visit after us with you. They made this presentation also of the landing of the rovers. And they have the primary ellipse where they try to land. Well, try. It depends on the, on the, on the entry. And then they have secondary. If they, if they miss the entry, then they have a very bad uh, option. And then a little bit later, they maybe can land on the next plateau or in the next crater, which is useful. So they have this uh, non-monotonic uh, but degrading function. So first time is best, second would still work, but in between there's a part that doesn't go. Okay. Um, Got to think about that one, but that, that's an interesting, uh, that's a pretty interesting example. So the, the, the main point here is that in order to calculate utility, you need a translation function between, you know, the, the engineering or financial attributes of each alternative and utility. It's, if, it's not, if it was directly that, you'd just have a linear, right? It would be a 45 degree line, right? Or negative 45. But, but typically the mapping from your attribute values to the utility is nonlinear. And that's what this says. So, uh, so then the challenge is, uh, well, how, how do you get these utility functions? Where do they come from? And the answer is, you've got to do interviews. You have to survey people. The decision makers, the stakeholders we talked about, they're the ones who have these utility functions in their minds, even though if they're not. So you've got to have to make those explicit. So here's an example. Uh, you may have three different customers for your system. Here's your attribute, some performance attribute. Customer one, uh, customer one is shown here. Uh, they need a minimum amount of performance, but once you reach this threshold, after that, there's no more utility. But then customer two and customer three are different. They want, you know, their, their, their utility increases gradually. And in fact, customer three doesn't see any much utility until you hit this much higher level. So one of the challenges then in designing these utility functions when you have multiple customers is to solicit this, and there's interview and, and survey techniques for doing that, uh, and then combining those. And then the other uh, challenge in combining them is that, remember, at the system level, utility is still between 0 and 1, right? So if you had, for example, two attributes, and they both give you perfect utility, and you add them together, you'd get a utility of what? You had two attributes. Two, but that, that can't be because the total system utility can never be better than one. So you have to normalize, as you combine the utilities, you have to normalize them and actually uh, weigh them as well. So here's, here's the equation when you have two utilities. Uh, you basically have the utility of the system just from J1, your first attribute, times the utility of J2. This is the mixed term, right, the, the combined term plus the utility of just U, uh, J1, plus the utility of just J2. And then you have this K factor here, this capital K factor, which renormalizes everything to 0 and 1. And if you have more than 2, then it becomes kind of a matrix calculation. So it's a little tricky for how to do this properly, but it, it's well known how to do this. So the steps in multi-attribute utility analysis are to identify your objectives and attributes, you develop an interview questionnaire, you administer that questionnaire, you then develop your aggregate utility functions, you determine the utility of your alternatives, and then you analyze the results. And there is one word of caution I want to give you, which is that utility is essentially the surrogate of value, but value often we express in, in, in dollars and in monetary terms, but utility is unitless. So um, let me uh, just comment about utility maximization. Uh, it's very common and generally well accepted. Um, it, it's a nonlinear combination of your criteria, your, your decision criteria. 
The downside of it is the physical meaning is, is often lost because the, the sort of engineering or customer focused attributes all get combined. So you say, this system has a utility of 0.83 and this one has a utility of 0.75. So one is better than the other, but immediately you want to say, well, why is that? You know, what does that mean? So then you have to backtrack and reverse engineer of how those utilities were calculated. Uh, you need to obtain a mathematical representation for all your utility functions. And this is a probably not just US centric comment. This is probably everywhere in the world more or less. But uh, the utility function can vary drastically depending on the decision maker. This is a big issue in government programs. So you guys, uh, it's uniform day I guess today. So uh, how long is a typical tour of duty of a program manager in the Pentagon? for you know, a big program, what would you say? It's usually three to four years. So three to four years, like it's written here. And what, what, does, that, what does that mean in practice for these utility functions and for programs? Yeah. Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot here. Um, well, you don't usually have a lot of overlap between the PMs. So as one goes out, another one's coming in. So you're you're losing a lot of experience, gaining somebody who doesn't have much experience. So there's a learning curve here. Right. Well, that's right. What I'm getting at is so that there's definitely that effect, but the priorities may be different. You know, whereas the the prior program manager really valued a lot um, you know performance or quick response and the next program manager because maybe the context has changed mm -hmm. is going is be very very cost conscious it really wants a system that's very very affordable and is willing to sacrifice performance for that so what the way you can think of this is the shape of the utility curves for those decision makers has now shifted and because of that the architecture or the choice of concept that you would go for may be different. This happens to NASA all the time, right? Right. And so this is not just a DOD issue. This is, and in the commercial world, you know, a new CEO comes in, new CTO comes in, uh, and these utility curves actually shift. So you got to be, you have to be aware of this. So one of the big topics there is, particularly now with NASA, is. Um, how do we? How do you choose an architecture, a concept that is robust to changing utilities and decision makers? So maybe you don't go for the super duper best, most exciting, most capable concept, but you go for the one that's least likely to be overturned or disrupted with the next administration. And and. This is a, a discussion, active discussion right now at NASA headquarters. You know, what are the investments you can make that are going to provide utility, even if the utility function of the future decision makers changes? It's a big, big topic. Um, the other thing is, of course, this requires your formulation of preferences, those K factors, those, K, those weightings, a priori, before you've actually scored the, the alternatives. <laughs> All right, so the, the example I want to talk you through is, um, is essentially a space tug. So we're going to do trade space exploration. There's a trade space, a design space of alternatives, conceptual alternatives. And we're going to, we're going to try to understand that using utility theory. And uh, let me explain to you what we mean by space tug. So a space tug is essentially a satellite that has the ability to change its orbital elements, right? There's six orbital elements. Uh, semi-major axis, eccentricity, inclination, right ascension of the ascending node, uh, and so forth, of, of a target satellite by a predefined amount without degrading its functionality in the process. So here's a, a picture of the Earth. Uh, there's two orbits. The space tug is here in, a, in the black orbit. And then our target satellite is in the orange orbit. And so the, the typical process is uh, the space tug waits in its parking orbit, the black orbit. It gets tasked, it transfers to the other orbit, searches for the target, identifies it, rendezvous and approach, docking and capture, does an orbital transfer, 
and then releases the target satellite at the new orbit, verifies its status, and then either goes directly to the next target or returns to the parking orbit. And as you can imagine, depending on the plane changes that are required here, this can be quite expensive. Uh, it's less expensive in geosynchronous orbit, and there, there are some capabilities uh, that we think heard about in the public that U.S. and maybe other countries have as well to do this. Um, and, uh, but there's also applications, commercial applications for it. So, for example, for space debris removal and things like that. So that's what we mean by space tug. So what are the attributes? What are the, uh, so this is based on a paper uh, from uh, 2003 called Understanding the Orbital Transfer Vehicle Trade Space. And uh, so here's, here's three attributes that are combined into utility. Total delta V capability. Delta V is the change in velocity. This essentially tells you where can it go. Uh, you calculate that from, from essentially the rocket equation. The second one is response time. How fast can it get there after it has been tasked? And there, there's a big distinction between, it's almost binary, between electric propulsion, which is very efficient but slow, and, uh, and then chemical propulsion. The third is the mass of the observation or grappling equipment. And so this tells you what it can do when it gets there. So the size of target satellites that can be actually interacted with. Those are the three um, attributes that define utility. And you combi we combine those into a utility between zero and one. And then this, in this case, cost or a surrogate for cost is kept separately. This is the vehicle wet and dry mass. These are the cost drivers. And this is calculated from some simple scaling relationships. And so what we're interested in is looking at the trade space of utility versus cost of the system. So how is uh, utility defined for a space tug? Um, so we have uh, response time, um, which is you know, bad in electric systems. A uh, total utility is a weighted sum, and then we estimate the cost from wet and dry mass. So the delta V utility is shown here. This is in terms of meters per second, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 kilometers per second. These are pretty large delta Vs. And what's interesting is this, this, uh, this is a larger is better, but it's a step curve. It's not a smooth curve, it's a step curve. Why is that? Because um, as you reach certain delta Vs, it enables, you know, operating just in geo or a Leo geo transfer or a Leo geo return, right? So you can, you can use the space talk more than once, the more delta V you have. And it's a step curve because as you hit this value of delta V, you can now operate in a different regime. Uh, the capability, the payload mass utility is, is essentially discrete, discretized between low, medium, high, and extreme. Uh, so low is for small satellites, medium is satellites up to one metric ton, up to three metric tons, and then more than five metric tons, which are the big you know, satellites in geosynchronous orbit. And then the weighting factors are, we're going to weigh capability 30%, uh, delta V 60%, and the time responsiveness of the system 10%. So time responsiveness is not that important compared to the other two. So once we have this, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the details of the, the calculations that, um, that's in that paper, which I'll post. Uh, you get this. So this is a cloud of points. Each point here represents a particular alternative or architecture. And we have the cost of the system in millions of dollars. So this is not cheap, right? This is a billion dollars, two billion, three billion. And then we have this utility, this dimensionless utility. And of course, what we're particularly interested in is this lower right corner, high utility, lower cost systems. And um, what we did here is to identify some uh, particularly interesting architectures. They're shown here in the space. So let me just explain two of them. Uh, one of them here, we, and we gave them names that are recognizable. So this point here, it's below 0.4 in utility. So it's a rather low utility, lower utility system, but it's also uh, relatively affordable. Is We call it the biprop low Earth orbit tender. So it's intended for use in low Earth orbit. 
and it has a dry mass of about 680 kilograms, a wet mass of 1400, so the difference is propellant, right, about 800 kilograms of propellant, and has reasonable size and mass fraction. And it's fairly responsive. Another uh, alternative is what we call the electric geocruiser. Sounds cool, doesn't it? This is basically a space tug that operates only in geosynchronous orbit. So you la launch it to geosynchronous orbit, but once it's there, it can do a lot. Um, but it's electric, so it's kind of slow. 711 kilograms dry mass, 1100 kilogram wet mass, um, and it, inc uh, it includes return of the tug to a safe orbit. And this is sort of a versatile space tug in the geo belt. So that, that's, the, that's the idea, is that you, that you calculate the utility, shown on the x-axis, you have the cost of the system, you have this cloud of points, and you start understanding what are the interesting architectures in that trade space. Um, this is the same trade space, but now what we've done here is we've shown the choice of propulsion system is critical. And what you can see here, it's really almost impossible to get to a utility of one. It's very, very hard. And uh, the reason for this is the rocket equation. You, you know, you see how these, so the, <clears throat> the blue are the bipropellant architectures, the uh, purple are the cryogenic, so these are LOX hydrogen uh, propulsion, the yellow ones are the electric propulsion system, and then we also have nuclear propulsion here, which clearly is, is challenging and has policy implications. So you can see the nuclear propulsion gets you close to much higher utility, but it's also much, much more expensive. But in all cases, as you're trying to get more and more utility, at some point you hit the wall because of the rocket equation, which is very nonlinear. You know, more fuel, in order to carry more fuel, you need more dry mass. More fuel and dry mass requires more fuel to push, and, and this, the system blows up on you. And you can see this in these curves. So you, you get some physical intuition in terms of the shape of the space. Yeah? Is there a reason between this sort of layering of cost yeah, they're, they're essentially, um, essentially, if I remember correctly, the, uh, the capability of the system. Do you remember there's the small, medium, large, you know, the, the size of the grappling equipment? Uh, I think that's the tiering that you see. Does change the Well, it depends on the weighting, right? So as you change the weighting among the attributes, that space can get scrambled. This, is, this, this space is valid for that particular weighting. So any, any questions about, uh, this is utility theory, multi-attribute utility theory applied to trade space exploration. Any, any questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. EPFL, do you have a question? Okay. Okay. So now what you see here is kind of implicitly is it, there's nothing here in the lower right corner. There's no system that has, you know, perfect utility and is, is low cost, right? There's, there's an empty space. We'd love to be here, but there's nothing there. So the best we can do is get close to that. And that's what I want to talk about next, which is this concept of non-dominance. So what do we mean by non-dominance? What is a Pareto frontier? And uh, what is multi-objective optimization? The key point about this is that when you do, do non-dominance filtering, when you look for Pareto frontiers, you do not need to express your preferences ahead of time, right? So when you do, util when you do a weighted Pew matrix or when you do utility theory, you had to define ahead of time, before you did the scoring, what's more important, you know, fuel efficiency is twice as important to me as cost, right? The weighting, the preferences had to be expressed a priori before you did the scoring. And, and you know, there's, there's arguments that that's not the best thing to do, but you can do it. Here, uh, in non-dominance uh, and multi-objective optimization, eventually you have to express your preferences, but you do it after you've scored the options. That's a really important distinction. So let me give you a little history here on this. And what's really interesting is there's a Lausanne connection, okay? There's a connection with Lausanne. So the word Pareto frontier, 
uh, is named after a, uh, a scientist, an economist who actually started as an engineer, Wilfredo Pareto. He uh, was born in Paris in 1848 um, and then graduated from the University of Turin in 1870, uh, very much in uh, engineering, civil engineering. His thesis title was The Fundamental Principles of Equilibrium in Solid Bodies, something we take, you know, that's pretty basic now, forces and torques in equilibrium on a, on a, on a body. Now, um, he worked, you know, as a civil engineer in Florence, and then he got interested in philosophy, politics, and economics, and he started to think about this in terms of uh, what, how does this concept of equilibrium apply to economics. And then in 1893, he actually became a professor at the University of Lausanne, which is located right next to uh, EPFL, and started applying this to, um, to, uh, to economics and sort of societal theory. And um, there, there, he did some, some of his work was a bit controversial, but the, the, the one that I want to talk about here is this, the idea of the Pareto optimum. And I will, let me just read this quote to you. The optimum allocation of the resources of a society is not attained so long as it is possible to make at least one individual better off in his or her own estimation while keeping others as well off as before in their own estimation. So what it means is if you can, if you can make an investment or make a change in society that makes a particular individual or group of individuals better off in their own estimation without having to take the resources from another group and make them less well off, then you've, you've not reached an optimal allocation of resources. You know, if there can be a win-win, if everybody can be better off by making certain investments, you haven't yet found the optimal strategy. Only when, the only way to make somebody better off in their own estimation than somebody else is by taking, and this is, you know, a big political debate still today, by taking from one group and redistributing resources to the other. When you're in that situation, then, then you're at the Pareto optimal uh, point, okay? So that's, uh, that's the key idea uh, underlying this. So what this means is, mathematically, uh, is that, um, a, an optimal solution, X star, is optimal if and only if uh, for a feasible solution. So first of all, the solution has to be feasible. And this is when you have multiple criteria. Uh, we're trying to do vector optimization. And X must be what we call an efficient solution. And it's efficient only if its objective vector, J of X, is non-dominated. And what this means is that if you're looking at a point, it's, it's only efficient when it is not possible to move from that point to another point without degrading uh, at least one of the other objectives. Okay? So if, if you can move from a particular design point to another design point and all the objectives get better, you're not yet efficient. You're not yet a, at a Pareto optimal point. Um, and this gets us to the notion of dominance, okay? So dominance, let's say we have two designs, two alternatives, uh, J1 and J2. Those are their objective vectors. It means that uh, this is for maximization. We're trying to maximize. It means J1 dominates J2 weakly if J1 is better or equal to J2. And uh, at least in one of the objectives, I, strictly better than J2, okay? So you could have two alternatives. This gets back to Pew matrix and the question, who asked about the ties? You did, right? <laughs> so long ago. It's like, wait a minute, it's like an hour ago, you know? So we have two alternatives, okay? They're all equal. They're, they're tied in all criteria except for one where J1 is better than J2 which means that J1 will dominate J2, but weakly, because there's some ties, right? And then there's a stronger definition, which is that J2 strongly dominates J2, J1 strongly dominates J2, if and only if it is better, strictly better, in all attributes. 
So for one to dominate J2 st strongly, it's got to be better in all attributes than J2. Does that make sense? Okay, so I know this is a bit abstract. So let's do a concept question that's sort of based on a, on a hypothetical but, but real example. So assume, let's say you're, you're in charge of designing a new commercial aircraft and there's four criteria. You want to maximize range. You want to minimize the cost uh, dollars per kilo, kilometer flown. You want to maximize the capacity of the airplane, number of passengers, and you want to maximize cruise speed in kilometers per hour. So it's a multi-objective aircraft design. You do all the work, you do concept generation, you come up with eight concepts for airplanes and you evaluate them. And they're shown here, one, two, three, et cetera, through eight. So let's just look at number one. What does this mean? Airplane number one, concept number one, has a range of 7,587 kilometers. It has a operating cost of $321 per kilometer. It can carry 112 passengers, and it has a cruise speed or max speed of 950 kilometers per hour. So I'm going to leave this up. This is a, like a five minute, this is sort of a, con um, on the next slide, I'm going to ask you, and we'll, we'll come back to this, which of these airplane designs, these eights, are non-dominated, meaning that they're not dominated by any of the other. And we're going to apply weak dominance here. That was going to be your question, right? Weak dominance. So I don't think it actually matters. I don't think there's too many ties in here, but uh, apply weak dominance. So which of these are non-dominated, meaning that you, you wouldn't discard them right off the bat, right? Because there's some strong features that they have. So work through this. Uh, you might want to write down uh, which ones are uh, non-dominated. And then we'll, we'll do the concept question, and then we'll show you the answer. I just want to make sure. So non-dominated as in there is not one that could be considered better than it? or Yeah. So um, just, this is the definition. <laughs> All right. So let me... So please submit your answers. So here are the choices. Uh, which airplane designs are non-dominated? Five, six, and seven. One, one, three, four, and eight. One, two, three, four, and eight. Two, three, five, and six. One, three, four, and seven. Or you need, this is not, in, this is not answerable. You need more information to answer the question. OK. So we have uh, a pretty, pretty good distribution here. So the wisdom of crowds, I think, prevails. <laughs> so the correct answer is the third one, one, two, three, four, and eight. So 36% of you got it right. Now let me, let me show you the, the solution to this. So it is, in fact, possible to answer this without additional information. So the way to do this is you have to do pairwise comparisons. Now, you, you said about, uh, I think your strategy, you said, what did you say early on? If you just push that. You were looking at maximums. So you were saying, who's the best performer among the concepts for each criteria? And, and you found those pretty easily, I would assume, right? Yeah. So what? Um, thing was the min cost as opposed to the max cost. Okay. So you got to get the sign right. Do you have the mic on, by the way? Um, so what would. If, if a concept is the best performer in a criterion, what does that tell you? Um, it means that none of the other performers have something equal to or greater than that uh, performer for that set right. criterion. So, and this, this relates to the question, is it, is it Mar Martin? Martin in the red shirt, first row? I didn't get your name right, I'm sorry. Bastien. Bastien, Bastien, Bastien. Do you remember at the start of the lecture, you said, what did you say at the start of the lecture? Um, I said that if you evaluate all the concepts um, based on just plus or minus for the criteria, you might have one where you um, evaluate uh, all the uh, a bunch of criteria that are 
negatives, but yeah. there's just one that is positive, but that one might be very, very positive. Right. So that's exactly the point here. That's exactly this point. If you are, if this concept is the best performer in just one of the criteria, like it has the best speed or the lowest cost, but it's terrible, terrible in everything else, it doesn't matter. In terms of dominance, it, cannot, it is non-dominated. It cannot be dominated by any other concept. If you are the best in class, even just for one criteria, does that make sense? You cannot be dominated by any other design if you're the best performer at, in, on just one criterion. So let's think about track and field, right? So the uh, people, who's doing track and field? Any athletes here, like runners or, or javelin or... Veronica, I didn't know that about you. Cross country and track, okay. So 5K? All right. So, but, so you, let's say you, I'm sure you were very good at 5K, right? And how's your shot put? I never competed in the shot put. Okay, so then we don't know, right? But uh, the point I'm trying to make is you could be a super duper specialist in one criterion and, and that's, you know, you can will, win a gold medal with that. But you're very, maybe not good in, in other things. So that's the point here is in order to be dominated, if you're the best performer, in, so right off the bat in this exercise here, in our little exercise, you can remove all the concepts that are best in class from the set because they cannot be dominated. So they have to be non-dominated. Okay? So the way you do the scoring with pairwise comparisons is you say, let's compare one and two, concept one and two. Well, one is better in, um, in range, right? Uh, and it's better in, in speed, but then the second concept is better in two and three. So the score here is two versus two, which means neither one nor two dominate each other, right? Even if it's, what if it's three to one? What if it was a three to one score? It would still be true, right? That one doesn't, one, it's, it's in a sense better because it's better than the other, but it doesn't dominate it. See, because dominance is a very crisp uh, definition. Now, this is different, right? Compare one versus number six. Concept one versus concept six. One is better in all four criteria to six. So clearly, solution one dominates solution si six. And as a rational decision maker, you can eliminate concept six from the, from the set because it is completely dominated by concept one, okay? So in order to be dominated, a solution must have essentially a score of zero in a pairwise comparison. Now, if we apply this to the full set of eight, we can actually show this as a matrix. I call that the domination matrix. It shows which solution dominate which other solution, the horizontal rows and the vertical rows. So the way you read this is, so where you see these dots, these are dominance relationships in the pairwise comparison. So this tells you that Solution two dominates solution five. Um, this tells us, if we look column-wise, solution seven is dominated by solutions two and solution eight. So if we do the row sum, if we sum this along the rows, the row indicates how many solutions this particular solution dominates. And, but the question was about non-dominance, so we need to look at the column sum. The column sum indicates by how many other solutions the kth solution or concept is dominated. And when you do this column sum, you can see that uh, concepts one, two, three, and four have a zero. They're not dominated by any other design. Column eight has a zero. And concepts five, six, and seven are dominated each by at least one other concept, which means that they're, they're, uh, they're dominated, right? And the others are non-dominated. So when you do your concept selection, you, apply, you can actually apply this to a much bigger set. You filter out all the dominated solutions. And it turns out the bigger your number of alternatives or architectures, the smaller percentage-wise the set will be of non-dominated solutions. And those are the ones you really want to focus on. Is that, is that clear? 
I, I, this, I know this, is, uh, this takes a little thinking about what does this really mean, but, but that's a very rigorous way to do it. Um, and then this, this gets us to, eventually, this gets us to the notion of Pareto optimality. So what's the relationship between Pareto optimality and non-dominance? So let's say we have two objectives. J1, we want to maximize J1. Maybe that's, you know, uh, performance, endurance. We want to minimize J2, maybe cost, for example. So the, the, the utopian point or the optimal corner to be in is the lower right, right? We want maximize J1, minimize J2. There's nothing here. It's empty. There's nothing feasible here. So the best we can do is get close to it. So when you look at a set of discrete points, discrete concepts, those concepts can have three properties. They can be D, meaning dominated. So all the, all the red points shown here uh, are dominated. And, and the way you can see this, if you, if you draw a little, let me, try to, let me try to draw a box here. Um, where's the uh, eraser? So let's, let's pick a point, a particular point. Uh, let's pick this point right here. Why do we know that this point is dominated? Just looking at it graphically. How do you know that? Go ahead. The point is not at the uh, in front. It's not at the front, but the way, the way to find, uh, first of all, whether it's dominated, which is relative to the other solutions, is we can just draw a horizontal line here, right, and a vertical line here. And so in a multidimensional space, you're essentially drawing like a hypercube. And here's, down here is our utopia, right? This is where we would love to be, but we can't be. It's not feasible. And you see, in this box between the point and the utopia, there is this other guy here, this point here. And because it's there, it's closer to the utopia, and it dominates this point, right, in both objectives. Let's take this point here. Let's do the same thing. Draw a vertical line and a horizontal line. And there's a whole bunch of points. All these points right here are all in the box closer to the, the utopian point. So this point here is actually dominated by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven other points, right? So that's, that's essentially dominated. Let me erase this again. Then we have, we have these darker red uh, purple points. Let me just circle them real quick. So we have this, this point here, this point, this point, this point, this one, and this one. And those are what we call non-dominated, like we just did the filtering, meaning there's no other point in the set that's better than it in all criteria. So you would, you would consider them as concepts to choose from. But they're not exactly on that dashed line, what, which means that there's a way to improve them. There's a way to tweak them to optimize them further if you could to get them right onto that dashed line. They're close, but they're not exactly on that dashed line. Right? So you could tweak these concepts to get them closer to the Pareto front. But they're still they're pretty good because they're non-dominated. And then we have those gray points, which are shown here. There's three of them. Uh, let me use a different color for these. Let me use a different color, maybe green. Oh, sorry. Here, this point, this point, and this point, they are Pareto optimal, <laughs> mean, meaning they're on the Pareto front. There's no way to improve them such that you could make both objectives better. Right? If you want to make J1 better, you have to sacrifice on J2. So the, the only way to modify these points is to slide along the Pareto front, which meaning, meaning you're trading off the objectives. Do you see that? And so in my, in my spring class that I teach called multidisciplinary system optimization, we get into this pretty deeply, like how do you actually do this? 
But the point, the point I wanna, want you to keep for now is that when you select a concept, do not select a dominated one. Get rid of the dominated ones, filter them out, and then you still have to choose among the others, and that's where your preferences come in. Right? So given the, the blue and green choices here, which one are you going to recommend at the end? And that dis that's a sort of a, a preferences between maximizing J1 and minimizing J2. That's a, that's a social process of coming up with your preferences. But you now determine those preferences after you've scored all the concepts. Do you, do you see the difference? That's pretty fundamental. Okay, so one more thing and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. So now you've gone through all this work, you've done your concept generation, concept selection, scoring, and you, you found the one concept that, um, that you're gonna go forward with. That's when you do PDR. So what is the PDR, the preliminary design review? You explain what concept and system architecture was chosen. You uh, explain why it was chosen. And, uh, and that's, you want this to be approved as the design baseline for going forward and doing more detailed design work. You compare it against the rejected alternatives. Typically at the PDR, you will spend some time on saying, these are the other interesting concepts that almost were selected, but we didn't because of these reasons. Uh, you show some quantitative analysis that gives confidence. Uh, especially you want to show that the requirements that you had defined and agreed upon at the SRR can be satisfied by your chosen concept. Uh, there may be st still some risk or some uncertainty, so any risk reduction experiments or prototypes, so you can actually do prototyping at this stage. You, you don't want to spend too much on that, but you want to do enough of it so you can reduce risks. And then you do a preview of the detailed design phase between PDR leading up to CDR. So here, I'm not going to read this, but this is the, this is the description of what the PDR is all about. Uh, in the NASA System Engineering Handbook, uh, on page 177, there's a very detailed description of you know, entrance criteria, exit criteria, et cetera, et cetera. So here's a, a description from a PDR, from a European program. And you can see it's a pretty big group, right? This is like 30, 40 people. And uh, because the PDR is such an important decision, uh, that's when you also invite external stakeholders. And you want to make sure that people come away from the PDR with confidence that, yeah, you know, we have a good system architecture. We picked a good concept. And it's worthwhile now putting all this work into getting it to a detailed design that can actually be built. Okay. Any, any questions about PDR or any experiences from PDRs that people want to share? Yeah. I have a question about the PDR. Yeah. Um, how, so you said there's 30 people in that picture. How, does, how do you reconcile that with the 7 plus minus 2 rule? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's 7 plus or minus 2 squared, right? So you have, you have, uh, you have a hierarchy of people. Not everybody oh, okay. is a decision maker here. Right. I see. So you have you probably have people who did some of the thermal design. Some people did the cost modeling. So um, it, it's a great question, actually. Uh, you want you want many many voices and people who contributed to make sure the PDR presents all the information you had. Uh, you don't want to do a PDR with just seven people. Right. But I guess you could say that like in the presentation, I guess only seven plus minus two will people will be driving at that point in time. And so there will be a leadership, right? Oh, I see. And, uh, yeah. So the, the, there is an organizational issue behind this. But, but the point here is that, that it, it is a, it is a, uh, it is a, it's a big review. It's a big milestone. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, the big issue here is that all the people that are not decision makers that are on that picture, they would have to implement the detailed design. So it's very important to have them in the process. Otherwise, you have to go back to your organization and do the sort of PDR again to explain when the what's and the why's. So this is why we try to have these very large meetings. I mean, you do a pre-PDR and you do a dry run and you send the stuff in advance and you make sure that you really only agreeing finally, if possible. You get the widths, uh, the, the discrepancies off the table, but then you all agree that this is how to go forward and then 
the work abuse can go and do it. Yeah, so that's another, yeah. another reason for, for being inclusive. I agree with that. Any other, uh, any, ha, who's gone through a PDR in their prior work? Do you, anybody want to share? Marissa, t I tell mean, us about how that went. I mean, as much, I know either you can't right. probably share everything, but just Yeah, for us, us I, mean, I mean, it was, I mean, it's a pretty big milestone. You work, you work a lot leading up to PDR, and then you finally have all the really big stakeholders in the room. And a lot of them have been involved during the design phases, but when you actually have them all sitting there, um, and kind of get, I think getting the buy-in was also a really, I think like that's a really big part of PDR. Like normally you're feeling pretty confident in your designs, but then actually making sure whoever the agencies that you're working with, then your stakeholders are also kind of all on the same page. Mm. It's pretty critical. Do you discover problems or discrepancies during PDR? Yeah, I definitely think, I mean, you know, de generally we've had Delta PDRs um, if things weren't completely thought through or you'd, mm -hmm. you'd have a fair number of action items that come out of PDR to go and address yeah. before you really are allowed to start moving towards CDR. Good, good. Any, any comments or experiences with PDRs at EPFL? I did a PDR at the European Space Agency during the Rexus Bexus program uh, three years ago, and as far as I remember, it was very appreciated to bring as many details as possible and uh, to be really close to the critical design review stage in the PDR. Mm, that's interesting. Um, so that, that's, that's good. I think there's good to have detail and so forth. But what's the downside? Can you think of a negative? What would be, what would be not so good about uh, almost being a CDR right there? Can you think of a, a, a downside to it? Probably not taking too much time in order to clarify the concept and the requirements because you are in a rush to do to finish the product. That's a that's a good point. Uh, so it's it's more it takes more time. But what I'm thinking about is it's very difficult to then undo the decision or backtrack. Let's say that at the PDR that there's some some you know it could be that you really forgot something very important and that that your concept is actually flawed, but you didn't know it as you were working inside your team. And then if you have a design that's almost CDR quality, it's very difficult to undo that. So I, I would say that a PDR, I actually, I actually believe that at a PDR, you should have some detail, but, but not too much yet. I, I think a true PDR should be at the system architecture level with some detail, but not all the details. But thank you, that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, um, comment. Thank you very much. So uh, let me close it here. So um, in terms of concept selection during conceptual design, we can use Pew Matrix selection. Um, and, uh, and that's essentially useful when we don't yet have those detailed mathematical models, it's qualitative. And then, you know, as we move more into preliminary design, we use utility analysis, um, especially for non-commercial systems where, you know, a net present value, a financial, you know, in commercial companies, you will often do a financial analysis, right, as a measure of utility. And then this concept of non-dominance is very, very important. Uh, generating many designs and then applying Pareto filters to, to, to come down to the non-dominated set. So that's essentially the essence of it. So I hope that was, that was clear. Um, A4 will be posted later today.